We're excited to spend some time uh, with you virtually uh, in the province of Saskatchewan. Um, we have uh, some information we want to share with you, and then certainly there will be time for some, some questions uh, at the end of our presentation. Um, SMRs and, and nuclear in general um, has been a, a big part of the clean energy mix here in Canada. Um, and this gives you a little bit of the history um, in Canada in the nuclear industry. We're the second country to produce nuclear power um, and the first country actually to declare that nuclear would only be used uh, and pursued for peaceful purposes. We have more than 50 years of commercial operation in the nuclear industry in Canada. Um, and there's a number of other statistics, but I think the one that I that I really like the most on this slide is that one quarter of our Nobel Prizes in Canada have actually been awarded uh, and related to nuclear science. Certainly, it's considered a strategic asset with a number of benefits, uh, economic, social and environment and geopolitical. Um, and if we think about some of the benefits the nuclear industry today brings as we think towards the future, uh, significant contributions, 76,000 jobs um, in the industry. There's more than 200 companies in the supply chain, contributes about $17 billion to the economy. And then, of course, there's the social and environmental uh, aspects, uh, isotope productions, uh, second largest source of non-emitting electricity in Canada, uh, offsets about 50 million tons uh, of CO2. Um, and so significant benefits that we've experienced as a nuclear industry here in Canada so far. Uh, if we think about GE, uh, GE um, has been operating in Canada for more than 130 years. Um, across GE businesses, uh, power, renewable, energy, aviation, and healthcare across our businesses in Canada, there's about 3,000 people that work across 40 sites. And so this just gives you a sense of uh, some of the locations that we have. Uh, here in Canada in a number of our businesses. We've been supporting carbon-free nuclear energy in Canada for a really long time, and this gives a good sense, I think, of the timeline and the businesses that we've had in Canada. Um, GE Canada was formed in Peterborough, Ontario, uh, back in 1891. Um, and so actually that's not far from, from where I'm uh, participating on this call today. It's about 25 minutes, I think, from my house. Um, we have certainly participated in a number of um, initiatives uh, in the Canadian nuclear industry for a, a really long time. Um, and I'm going to get into some more specifics here um, on the next slide. But suffice it to say, we've participated in uh, the research reactor in White Shell, Manitoba, was uh, we participated in that and supported that initiative. Uh, we have manufactured fleet we uh, fuel for the fleet. Um, GE Hitachi manufactured fuel for the Kandu fleet. There's a lot of similarities with the Kandu fuel and the BWR fuel, um, and so uh, we'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, but we certainly manufactured fuel for many many years. In terms of our history in nuclear, GE Hitachi has been doing this uh, for several decades. Our first involvement uh, in uh, nuclear physics dates back to 1939. Um, we have a number of milestones. Uh, certainly, these aren't the only milestones in our nuclear portfolio, but these are some that we like to highlight. Um, in uh, Canada, uh, we were part of the Nuclear Power Demonstration Unit in Chalk River. Uh, and the nuclear power demonstration unit really uh, formed the basis for the Kandu fleet. So uh, we have been part of, uh, you know, sort of the start of the nuclear industry here in Canada, uh, which means we're really excited to be part of the next chapter of nuclear. Um, in our global footprint, uh, we hold license number one in the United States with our Valacitos uh, boiling water reactor. Um, number of other milestones here. Um, as an international company, we've we've done this before. Uh, we've we have 67 boiling water reactors in 10 countries around the world. And so um, our technology and experience uh, have enabled uh, strong success in these areas. Um, as probably most of the people calling in know that uh, most recently we were selected by Sask Power uh, in their technology selection. And so 
uh, that gives us a real opportunity uh, to work uh, in Saskatchewan uh, and with Sask Power, which is a, is a great utility. I'm going to turn it over to Doug as the product manager for the BWR X300. He, uh, he's certainly um, an expert in this area. So Doug, I'll hand it over to you. Doug? Oh, Doug, you're on mute. <laughs> okay. I was worried that was me. No. <laughs> no. Uh, do you guys not hear me? I my red yeah, button. No, no. Good. Okay. Good Interesting. Now. Uh, thank you. Uh, I am joining you this evening from Wilmington, North Carolina, on the Atlantic coast of the United States. Uh, the BWRX 300 is, first of all, a BWR, a boiling water reactor. That is the simplest way to make energy from nuclear power. And the reason I say that is we generate energy from the fission process within the reactor, and we also make the steam within the vessel. And so you can see here in the picture, it shows a reactor pressure vessel. That is where the steam is generated. Energy is made from nuclear power or nuclear fission. And then the steam is actually dried out a little bit before it's sent directly to the turbine. And then the turbine, uh, in between the two, we don't have any steam generators. We don't have, have to have a pressurizer or things of that nature. We send the steam directly from the reactor pressure vessel to the turbine, much in the same way as I sort of describe it as a tea kettle. Uh, the turbine takes energy from the steam, turns a generator, generator, and that is what produces the green, green electrons, non-carbon emitting source electrons that go onto the grid. The steam ex exhausts all of its energy in the turbine and then is passed to the condenser where the steam, residual steam is condensed into water. Then we go through a heating system and pumps to get it ready back to the, to the right pressure and right temperature before it's turned to the reactor pressure vessel. For the BWX300, we chose to use natural circulation. Many of the plants in operation today are first forced circulation, which require extra loops and extra uh, pumps and motors to cause that circulation within the reactor pressure vessel. But for simplicity's sake, we use natural circulation for the BWX300. For uh, the fuel, as Lisa mentioned, we're using exactly the same fuel as in operation today. We have over 25,000 bundles of the GNF2 fuel that the BWX Strand uses in operation or have been operated successfully, successfully over the past 15 years. And with that, it is actually a low enriched uranium bundle. And low enrichment in this case means less than 5% enriched uranium. Some of the other technologies you may hear out there have what is called uh, high enriched low assay uranium, which is about 20% which is actually have a supply chain challenge at the moment. Uh, the major source was in Russia. However, recent world events has caused that, to, that source to go away. The BWX300 uses uranium that can be sourced in the worldwide market. Natural uranium is in mind in Saskatchewan today, but it needs to be enriched. And perhaps in the future, as the BWX300 gains more and more units within Canada, there's a possibility for enrichment to occur in Canada, but we shall, that will develop over time which is a natural course as we build more reactors in Canada. Next slide, please. In 2017, there were sort of a change of the way that our industry was thinking. There have been many reactors that had been canceled. Some reactor projects had gone very long. Some had actually bankrupted uh, some companies involved in them. And the customers were really looking for a way, how do we put significant new nuclear onto the grid and make a difference in our climate change. With the BWX 300, we try to adjust those concerns. We looked at a reactor that wasn't too big and wasn't too small. And so in Canada, you have a uh, SMR roadmap and it has three different streams in there. The BWX 300 is looking at the grid connectivity size reactors. You also have ones that are used for process heat or powering industrial facilities, which the BWX 300 can also do. And then you have a smaller reactor type, micro reactors, which are well suited for remote communities. The BWX 300, is, like I said, is sized at about 300 megawatts electric, which makes it a good size to put on the, in for the grid itself. It is a 10th generation. That's what the X after the BWR stands for. And so this is the, actually the 10th generation in the evolution of the boiling water reactor. We made sure that as we designed it, <clears throat> that we found a way to break the paradigm of past reactors 
where we tried to increase the economic viability by making the plants bigger and bigger and bigger. This has allowed us to some extent to get lower dollars per kilowatt. However, what happened is we started getting to megawatt, multi thousand megawatt, 1500 megawatt range is the projects got so large and so complex that when they're trying to be implemented in the field, if any small change, small perturbation, small issue happened, it became a large concern. And as large as these projects were, any type of delay would cause problems. And like I said, some have actually caused problems to the point of causing companies to go bankrupt. And so we wanted to make sure that we had the right size and we also had manageable projects. And that's exactly what we're doing there. And we're also bringing forward the fuel and other best practices from the fleet today. With our first unit, we're trying targeting going operational by 2028, and that would be at the Darlington New Nuclear Power Plant in Ontario, and then followed quickly by some of our other partners. Next slide, please. The most important method change we made with the boiling water reactor, a beta rig standard, is to change the way we deal with loss of coolant accidents. These are postulated accidents that have never occurred in a boiling water reactor, and we need to figure out how do we manage to deal with those while reducing complexity. Our predecessor plant, most recent, our ninth generation, was called the ESBWR. It was a very large plant, about 1,500 megawatts electric, compared to 300 for the BWX 300. It was also natural circulation. It was also using passive safety systems. But the way it dealt with these hypothetical situations was it allow a pipe break to occur let all the energy be released from the reactor pressure vessel into the containment. And this is the same in all light water reactors in operation today. With the BWX 300, what we did is we turned that equation around. Instead of letting a pipe break occur or continuing to occur and making it larger to actually get low pressure and high pressure, we took the strategy of bottling up the reactor. And so we moved isolation valves integral with the reactor pressure vessel. In this, and so in this situation, if a pipe break did occur, we could bottle them up in a fail-safe manner, so no power is actually even required to do this, and we put an isolation condenser, which is shown on the top right-hand side there, into service. The isolation condenser is a tube heat exchanger sitting in a pool of water. So the steam coming from the reactor pressure vessel goes into those tubes, doesn't directly interact with that pool of water it's sitting in, transfers heat, cools down, and condenses. Once it's condensed, gravity drains it back into the reactor pressure vessel. And this sets up a natural circulation, passive situation where the heat from the reactor core, even when it's shut down, is being removed to an outsized source, in this case, this pool of water. This allowed us to greatly reduce the complexity of the buildings. You can see in the center picture here, lots and lots of blue water, the blue pieces which are water. On the right-hand side, we've been able to remove a lot of that water while even simplifying while getting even better safety out of the actual reactor in the way that we analyze it. So it's had a great improvement on the safety and we're able to get 50% reduction in the amount of materials required to build the plant at the same in the relative number of megawatts. And so it allowed us to break that economies of scale that we've been building up over years and years where we're getting bigger and bigger plants to try to get to better economies. This allowed us to break that paradigm and get into the module small module reactors. Next slide, please. And this is showing you an example, an illustration of when the steam water comes in the bottom of the vessel. We can see sort of the more blue portion as it comes up to about the mid-range or slightly below mid-range where the reactor core is. It's actually turning into steam on the inside uh, of the reactor pressure vessel. Then the moisture gets removed and the steam actually goes up. In normal operation, this would be going to the turbine. But in off normal conditions, when loss of the grid goes away or there's a large earthquake or something of that nature, what we do is we turn off the steam going to the turbine and then open it up, the valves up to put this isolation condenser in service. And so you can see here, it's already been in service for a while. The steam is condensing inside those heat exchangers sitting in the top right hand side. And that water is now steaming off. There's no direct interaction from the steam in the reactor pressure vessel to that pool of water. It goes through that heat exchanger. Over time, that level will drop down. We have three of these trains for the BWX 300. Any one of them is able to remove the, the heat during design basis accidents without any operator action and with no power. 
They can remove that heat for at least seven days. If multiple systems are in operation, which they almost always will be, we can go closer to two weeks. If by two weeks, the normal plant operating systems haven't been brought back online, for whatever reason, it is simply adding additional water to those pools, which are at atmospheric condition, open to the atmosphere, or <clears throat> to nominal pressure, to allow additional time. And there are pre-existing, pre-engineered connections to get to those pools from an outside source. And so we have emergency response centers, which contain pumps and, and water sources to bring in to the case to actually fill those pools up to extend time if necessary. This is an overall way that we add multiple layers of defense and to ensure that any time a unusual situation happens, we correct it before any type of damage occurs or any type of radioactive releases recur. Next slide, please. With that, we had the simplification. The next thing we wanted to do was make sure that we could actually build the reactor and the power plant in a very easy, as easy as possible manner. And so you can see in the center of this picture, this is the reactor building where all the safety related equipment, highest safety related, is contained. It has a right circular cylinder, a very simple shape to construct. It is about two thirds and buried, buried underground. So the nuclear core is actually underground and this is for the VWX 300. And it is resistant to aircraft impacts, uh, any type of terrorist attacks has great resistance to that. And like I said, it contains all the safety related equipment into one one building. The other buildings are actually more normal to a normal power plant or industrial build buildings. On the right-hand side, you have the control building. On the left-hand side is the turbine building. And the turbine in this particular case is actually very similar to what is used in a gas-fired plant, uh, where you have the gas producing a lot of the steam, our energy to turn the turbines, but also there is a steam cycle on the back end of that that also provides additional power. Or in the case of Saskatchewan, you'll find it's very similar in your coal plants, this type of situation. The other the building that is not on this page, which is actually coming out as you're looking into it, is the Rad Waste Building where we process all of the chemicals that we have in there. And that is a using tried and true methods and using best practices gained over the last 60 years. The turbine itself is actually an off-the-shelf that is used in the combined cycle plants, as I mentioned before. Next slide, please. And back to you, Lisa. All right, I'll pick it up from here. Thanks, Doug. Um, so we have um, been building our business here in Canada uh, for for some time now. Um, you know, we are certainly proud of the efforts that we've made in terms of employment opportunities. Um, we have had some great engagements with universities. I think, you know, when we think about <clears throat> the opportunity for um, a new fleet approach and, and, and technology deployment. Uh, it's important certainly that we think about how do we develop uh, the talent pipeline. Universities in, uh, in Canada uh, have had a role in research and, and uh, development. And so certainly we are exploring opportunities there. Um, we have a virtual reality training facility uh, that's currently located in Ontario, where uh, the first uh, project with Ontario Power Generation with is, has been started already. Um, and we use actually a lot of virtual reality uh, training uh, in, in our fleet approach um, and across the business. And then, of course, we've had significant supply chain engagement. Uh, the nuclear supply chain uh, in Canada is uh, healthy and strong, and we're certainly looking to tap into um, existing and new businesses uh, in the supply chain as we look at deploying uh, the BWRX 300. This is a photo of our virtual reality uh, simulator. It's I call it our nuclear Nintendo Wii. Um, it certainly is um, an experience, and Hopefully, we will have the opportunity to uh, come to Saskatchewan in person um, and bring uh, bring our, our VR room uh, for folks to experience. This just highlights some of the partners. Uh, when we think about the opportunity for our reactor and, and a fleet-based approach, uh, certainly Canada, uh, as a first mover, um, has a significant opportunity with uh, SAS Powers Tech Select, 
Ontario Power Generation Selection, but also um, in other countries around the world. So Poland, for example, Synthos Green Energy uh, is in Poland. Um, they plan to deploy at least 10 BWRX 300s uh, reactors. And then we also have Tennessee Valley Authority um, in, in Tennessee, uh, you know, developing their construction permit for BWRX 300 at the Clinch River site. And so this enables really a very much a fleet based approach uh, where we have uh, utilities and partners working together uh, with uh, GE Hitachi and uh, supply chain on this opportunity. Uh, happy to share this report, um, Desiree, maybe we can figure out how, how to share it, but um, this is a, a bit of a snapshot in terms of the economic impact analysis. One of the things, I've been in the nuclear industry almost 19 years, one of the things that I generally like to talk about is that full value proposition of the nuclear industry. Uh, so clean energy, uh, certainly top of the list in terms of value, but also um, the benefits to the economy, um, significant impact to jobs, the supply chain, isotopes. Um, and so this gives you a, certainly a snapshot in terms of, of uh, the jobs uh, during manufacturing and construction um, and then ongoing operations. And so, you know, we are certainly an international company uh, with uh, a proven track record and, and significant experience um, having deployed 67 reactors in 10 countries. This being the 10th generation or 10th iteration of our boiling water reactor means uh, we're, we're familiar with the components, we're familiar with the reactor and the design um, in a way that will enable us uh, to deploy uh, successfully. It's certainly the simplest and most cost competitive design um, and there is a significant Canadian export opportunity with our technology. Uh, 